Hey, Jason Parks here. Welcome to season two of the Virtuality Podcast. It's an exciting time to be in the XR industry, and we'll be here to bring you more in-depth interviews with pioneers, influencers, thought leaders, and creatives. We're actively looking for more guests to bring on the show. Please reach out to us if there's someone you'd like to see. Thanks for listening, and without further ado, enjoy the show. So welcome to the Virtuality Podcast. This is Craig Herndon with Jason Parks and Kathy Bisbee from the Brookline Interactive Group. Uh, I really do want to thank you for coming on the show today. Uh, so why don't you first just tell us like what is the Brookline Interactive Group sure. um, and like a little bit about how you ended up at the Brookline Interactive Group. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks so much uh, for having me on your show. I'm excited to uh to be here. So Brookline Interactive Group is a community media arts center and uh, the Public VR Lab is a project of Brookline Interactive Group that we started about two years ago. And um, Brookline Interactive Group actually used to be called Brookline Access Television and a lot of people, unfortunately, the connotation that folks have when they think of public access television is Wayne's World, you know, two guys in their basement. <laughs> making a TV show, which is very different from where we are right now. Um, we are in a very high-tech community studio, television studio. We have two television studios here at our facility, but we're kind of the next generation of community media. And we're really hoping to uh, create a rising tide that lifts all boats for community media. And that's uh, a lot of the work is really tied to how we're trying to support our movement as community media as a become next generation stations and media centers across the country. So I, I got involved um, in Brookline Interactive Group. I have been here for three years in Boston, in Brookline. And I came from California where I uh, worked, I was a community organizer. I first, I left Maine and went to California, um, you know, go west, young <laughs> woman, go west. So I did, and I was out there for 22 years actually, and it was it was amazing, and it was really great to have sort of this East Coast sensibility and be in California. Um, you know, I worked as a community organizer, I worked on environmental issues, I worked on social justice issues, um, I worked with the UFW, I worked um, with all kinds of really awesome people in the Santa Cruz County and area. And UFW being the <clears throat> United Farm Workers. Oh, okay. So. Um, Literally, the, the guy who represented Cesar Chavez back in the day as his attorney, he was a very young attorney, uh, he was somebody that I helped uh, support as he became a uh, local politician and then a state rep, and now he's a state senator. And uh, so I, I worked on all kinds of campaigns, everything from the political campaign to, to more really grassroots community organizing, mm -hmm. and then went into the tech sector for 13 years in Silicon Valley, which was really interesting. I worked for uh, one of the first ISPs in the country, internet service oh, providers, wow. Cruise.io, and they had this crazy looking cat on a computer. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> check it out. Um, and the I and the O is input and output. Cats have been around since the very beginning. Of they, the yeah. <laughs> they have, they have. And it, actually, it's a great story. They. Um, they had a, a Nina Paley, who was a cartoonist. She was their roommate at the time. She couldn't pay rent, so they had her make a logo for their new internet service provider business that they started in 1989. So I was wow. one of the first 10 employees for that, and uh, it was an awesome experience because they were super community-focused and really mm -hmm. got that supporting the community was also good for business. Right. And so I learned a lot from the husband and wife team, Chris and Peggy, that, that ran Crusoe and started Crusoe, and then worked over in Silicon Valley on digital storytelling initiatives and social networking uh, back in 2006 and 2007, so right when Facebook kind of went out to the general public, we were doing some of that kind of work. So kind of storytelling, community organizing, right. and then um, the last almost 10 years, this is my 10th year now, in community media, running community media centers in California, and now Boston, Brookline. Awesome. Nice. Well, Kathy, you know, that being said, you, you're a big proponent of uh, entertainment and media education for Brookline and I would say the Boston area. Uh, I know that you've also gotten into VR and you've created the uh, public VR lab here at Brookline Interactive. Could you talk a little bit about how you started that and what sure. made VR so important for you? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm also a filmmaker and so I've done a lot of documentary film work and um, love storytelling. And I'm always looking for what are the tools that we can use to tell stories? And then how do we teach our community how to, how to actually use those tools? So <clears throat> when I first encountered VR, it was Google Cardboard. And I was like, 
watched some experience and I was like, eh, I'm not really that into this. Um, it was really the Syrian refugee stories that came around the summer of 2015, right around the same time when um, the New York Times put out the Google Cardboard in mm. their, their Sunday edition, yep. um, that I think it, it resonated for me all of a sudden. It was really sudden. I was kind of, I wasn't really that into games, so I didn't really get it. I'm more of a storyteller. So when that came out and I had an experience at Future Storytelling Conference down in New York City, uh, inside an Oculus for the first time, and I pulled the headset off and I was in tears and I was so moved by that experience. I really felt like I was at that refugee camp in France with this young Syrian girl. Um, and then I, I think I really just understood the value proposition immediately of how we could use immersive storytelling to create that visceral and hopefully empathetic experience as well. So <clears throat> we ordered one of the first, uh, I think we were one of the first 15,000 Vives that um, got ordered uh, two years ago, around this time actually, in January. And uh, we, we kind of began the process of uh, formulating the Public VR Lab really out of the belief that just like we'd been doing in community media for 35 years, yep. we should be providing access to the same kinds of tools for emerging filmmakers and storytellers, both in our community and in Boston, but we're also now doing national work and international work um, recently with our trip to the United Nations um, in Kenya. Yep, so Lex, let's go straight into your work with the United Nations and kind of what sure. you were doing. Sure. Um, so yeah. we've actually at the lab created uh, eight AR and VR experiences, so we've completed those. Um, we did a VR eco hack last spring, which was awesome. I know you guys were Super part successful. of that. Super successful. Super <laughs> successful. We're going to do it again in 2019. Um, we're probably going to focus on web VR for that because we feel like um, one of our main goals is reducing barriers to entry, just mm. like we did with traditional media. We're doing that in the VR space as well. So how can we democratize VR? How can we make it accessible? How can we make sure creators know how to create content in it? So um, we did the VR eco hack for that purpose and really creating educational curriculum um, focused on climate change. So we kind of got noticed um, by the UN as part of that process. Our partner, Amy Kamarinen at Harvard School Graduate School of Education, uh, connected us up with the UN. They invited us to come. They wanted us to show some of the content from the EcoHack. But, you know, two days of creating content in one was in web VR and they just learned it over the course of the weekend. One was in AR, which they also had just learned um, for HoloLens over the course of the weekend, which was amazing. And then another was a, was a VR and Unity piece that were the winners of the, of the eco hack. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of folks leave after a hackathon and they don't work together. So we couldn't really yep. get that to work. And also the focus was on pollution and air pollution for this UNEA conference, which is the United Nations Environment Assembly that's held every other year. So this was their third annual UNEA, or third third total uh, event in Kenra, Kenya, in Nairobi, Kenya. So they asked us to create something about air pollution. So we worked with Datavise down in New York, and uh, Deborah Anderson and I and um, Brian and the team basically created this customized air pollution experience for the UN. So you can walk into VR and you can look at a globe, you can look at every country and see what the particulate matter is for each of those countries. And here for about 10 of them, um, some narration as well about what's going on really in those countries right now in terms of the decline or the increase in air pollution. So that was really exciting. We had over 800, about 800 to 1,000 ministers and heads of state. Oh, wow. Yeah, and delegates wow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> show up. I was so nervous. It's a little intimidating. <laughs> I was so nervous. The assistant secretary general came up, and um, he had a posse of like 50 people around him, and I just and nothing was working. We were having issues because of the sun. <sighs> so we had a Oh, a it was tent. outdoors. It was outdoors, and, and there was this tent. And so all of a sudden, everything just and didn't work Were you anymore. trying to do the vibe? We had three vibes set up, oh, and, uh, and yeah. we know about the signal <laughs> okay. interference yeah. issue. We've had that happen before, but the sun yeah. was yeah. so bad. And uh, could have warned you. <laughs> you know, we knew we knew about it. We just didn't know we were going to be inside of a tent and and have it come right. through, I penetrate see. through. You know. Right. So thankfully, um, Andrew, our, our tech, totally right minutes before he walked, the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations Environmental Program walked over. <laughs> It all started working, and we got um, a great photo op, and also he got to try this experience, and he had never tried VR before. That we oh, know. wow. So, and we were the, I think we were one of the two first uh, volumetric experiences and web VR experiences 
ever um, shown at the UN. So it was really an honor to be able to go and, and represent, um, you know, have some discussions that were about, you know, what's going on in the US these days, <laughs> which were a little challenging, but um, so exciting to see how people, especially Africans actually, um, who have a really different cultural reference point than Westerners, mm -hmm. to see how they experience VR was just, it, it really changed how I'm thinking about our work, actually. I see. How did they respond it's, differently? Yeah. What, what was different? So, <laughs> so for example, <laughs> they just had this like sense of awe and wonder <laughs> and play that, ah, oh, man, it's just, um, if I could get everyone here just to play more as adults, that would be my dream. Um, <laughs> it was so fun. Every single person who is, who seemed to be from Africa, a lot of them, um, they, they were just, um, so playful. I mean, it was their first time in VR and they were really animated and, um, like, you know, People had strange thoughts about VR too that I hadn't run into. Uh, for example, this one guy and his wife um, took off the goggles. He took off the goggles and he says to to, my, to one of my partners, he said, uh, "There is there is an ocean under here." And we looked at him. And we we're like, "What?" And uh, and we said, "Oh no, yeah, in the computer you were looking at the blue. You were looking at uh, Weaver's the blue." Um, so yeah, you saw the whale. He says, "Yes, it was right under this tent. This, 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 there was a, there was an ocean flowing through this tent, and he meant literally. Like he right. really, really bought the, the the visceral sense that it was that it was true. And his wife, when she got out of it, she said, um, you should ask them if you can borrow the goggles.' And we said, "Oh yeah, for what?' And he, well, he knows where there is treasure. And they literally thought like you could see through." material objects with these goggles, with the VR goggles. Oh, interesting. And I thought that was amazing. I would yeah. never even have thought of that. It never, it never occurred to me, you know. Right. Um, so it's really interesting to see how different cultural reference points right. um, come into play when you're demoing VR. I mean, we've shown thousands and thousands of people VR, and so it's really interesting to watch people's reactions. Wow. So it sounds like the public VR lab is focusing on um, immersive storytelling. Yes. So could you talk a little more for our listeners who may not sure. know what that is, uh, what you're doing with immersive storytelling and, and maybe a little bit of what you've done recently other than what we've just talked and, about? And I guess what, what yeah. is it about storytelling that you specifically want to focus on mm -hmm. as opposed to just trying to like teach someone something that I feel like when people talk about like VR and education, it's very much focused on like trying to get something across, mm. um, but you're very much, I feel like you're trying to do the same thing, but you're very much focused on the storytelling aspect of it. Yeah. Um, why is that? Well, I'm gonna talk philosophically, I think, here yes. for a moment, <laughs> which <laughs> is, um, I want people to question what reality is. Mm. I want people to ask questions. One of the things we teach here, um, even outside of VR, but definitely inside of VR, is uh, media literacy. We don't, we have a very low level of media literacy in this country. We need to be asking more critical questions. People need to be thinking about their choices as consumers. They need to be asking questions of their elected officials, of each other. Um, and a lot of times people are just acting as consumers and they're not really asking the right question. So we wanna, we wanna get people to think critically. So I think VR sort of helps provoke some of that thought mm inside of an experience, whether it be a gaming experience or an educational experience, it, it makes you, it challenges your assumptions about what's real. And I think that's a really key part of our work is to challenge people's assumptions in general, to think about what's possible, what could we create here at the Public VR Lab as artists, as, um, as activists. Uh, as filmmakers, but also how do we challenge our viewers to maybe think differently about some topic they've already seen in a single frame. But seeing something in a single frame is so different than having an experience with the, with the content. It's like you're actually able to step inside of a story as opposed to have it told to you in one frame. So we like to call it um, filmmaking in full frame. And uh, and the reason for that is that that frame is all around you. So it's, you know, 360 video is like putting a fishbowl over your head and being able to see in every possible direction around the fishbowl. Um, <clears throat> that's more 360. VR, more volumetric VR, is actually being able to move around inside of the fishbowl and then interact with the fish or with, um, the, you know, mermaid sculpture or what have you. Um, or maybe the mermaid comes to life and you can interact with the mermaid or with the sailor or what have you. Um, and then I think with AR, you know, it's a little less immersive in some ways to do AR because you know that you're in, quote, reality. 
But I think that this, this um, the idea of having a visceral experience inside of a story is a really powerful one for filmmakers and for storytelling because it's similar to being, to kind of standing around the fire. And uh, we all know that we have this sort of, um, I think ancestral knowledge about storytelling and ancestral energy about storytelling where we all actually tell the same stories even. I mean, Joseph Campbell talks, uh, talked in his work about the hero's journey and how in every single story um, around the world and every culture around the world, there's the same basic story of, and I'm gonna use the, the heroine. Um, you know, the, our heroine is in the, in the village and she's sort of trying to figure herself out and so she knows she has to leave the village and then she leaves the village and then she, you know, has metaphoric or literal dragons fights the dragons, um, whatever that dragon may be, and then comes back victorious to the village to be greeted kind of as a changed person. Yep. And I think, um, so we all know storytelling. We know, we know the types of stories and we, we know that a good story makes you feel something. It makes you provoke thought. It often makes you feel empathy or, or compassion. It makes you uh, feel like you could understand someone else's perspective. And we feel like that's really important work to be doing. Mm. We're not in charge of telling people how to think, but we are in charge of facilitating a community discussion and getting people to think differently and challenge their assumptions about what is or what could be. Right. And uh, a lot of people will say like Star Wars is an example of the Hero's Quest. Uh, Moana is another example. Uh, that they're, they're just every, and those are all recent examples, right? Yep. Um, you go way back and you have like the Iliad and like it's throughout our entire history, there's so many hero's quest, hero's journey type stories. Yep. Um, so I'm almost curious if you think that is VR going to introduce new types of stories or is it just going to make them just more immersive? That's a good question. I mean, I think it makes us do a lot of things. I mean, and we can be time travelers, which is not something we've ever been able to do in storytelling. Right? Really. Right. Not in an immersive way. Right. It's always in a linear it's way. It's always in a linear way. It's also an authored story. I mean, it's still authored, I think, inside the VR experience. I right. think that, I think there's always a longing it, for an author story. It's all about story. perception, though. It is. Like, it's about perception, but it's also about um, that viscerality, I think, is is really the defining thing. It's not just immersive. It also, I think the best VR experiences and stories actually make you feel like you're inside of that place and you are that character. Right. And that's not something that outside of people who play D&D, &D, much of the general population understands, like that role playing or LARPing actually. LARPing is a great example and also theater. I mean, thinking about the fact that theater has been around for century after century after century and ritual is a part of this human experience that I think we can bring into VR and think about how could we maybe be more inclusive in VR? How could we maybe make sure that the characters that are depicted are representing our entire community and the experiences of our entire community? I think that it being immersive just is a conduit to other ways of telling stories and maybe even new stories. Maybe you could, I mean, maybe you'll really feel like you're going back in time. Maybe you feel like you're a character inside of Star Wars. I mean, we've never been able to do that before. Yeah, I, I want to feel like the thing I did five minutes ago in this VR experience affected what happened 10 minutes later and then be able to go and change that. <laughs> I can think of a lot of things I like to change, mm -hmm. but, you know, they all work out the way they're supposed to, I guess. Right. And, and I feel like with, like, video games, like, very much RPGs have been trying to do this for a very long time where like what the decisions that you make matter. Mm. Um, but I feel like with VR, the difference is just the, the feeling of presence and w just because you're moving your hands, right. that you are changing the outcome with your own embodiment um, yeah. as opposed to just at using a keyboard and mouse. Like it, it's right. different and then like until you try it, you're not gonna understand that. Um, like I, there's no way for me to communicate that to people and that would make things so much easier if I could explain what a VR experience was like um, to someone who hasn't tried it because I, I really have not been successful in doing that yet. Have you heard people um, say it's kind of like sex? <laughs> you can't really try it. You can't really explain it until you tried it. Yeah, and, the, and mm. then like you Maybe get it. Maybe explanation, <laughs> but Well, part. I've had friends who like had no interest in it whatsoever um, and then they're at my house. I'm like, what's right there? Like you should try it. And yeah. then they do not even a minute in and they're like this changes everything 
<laughs> Absolutely. Um, it does. It really, I've seen, I mean, we, we've been doing it at senior centers for the last two years. So we have um, seniors that are trying VR all the time. And same. Yeah. They go out yeah. there. It's pretty incredible. The experiences and, and oh, yeah. the re reactions you see from them. Absolutely. I did a lecture a couple of weeks ago here with all Brookline um, folks and it was, it was all people uh, who are seniors. And, uh, I have to say they were one of the most engaged audiences I've ever spoken to about VR because, again, they were similar to the experience we had in Kenya where they were just so excited about the technology and about what the opportunities afforded them. You know, I was showing them how they could fly over Florence and they're like, what? I mean, it just blew their minds what, what was possible. We got three volunteers out of that lecture who all want to come in. Um, and one who, you know, was a retired engineer programmer who has been learning Unity. So how cool. He can come in, be part of our VR Academy, and help other people be able to create content in VR. We actually now have six different ways you can create content in VR here at BIG that we teach. So we're hoping, we're hoping more seniors actually working with our 15-year-old high school students in our job training program, working together, creating a, an AR experience on history here in Brookline. It's actually one of our projects where they uh, are creating uh, AR experience to follow the web VR experience that we created of all of the monuments and public art in Brookline. And so the next step is to have AR uh, stories that are part of that storytelling project as well. Of like going to the monuments and then having an AR experience at each one? Yep, or so having, you know, like I wanna have the uh, Revolutionary War guy with the three corner hat, talking in a very strong Sam Adams type voice, um, that Have just the statue pops get up. up, start walking around. I don't <laughs> yeah, the statue walking around would be super cool. Um, but even just you know, even just having that feeling of like what it would be like if I could try time travel. You know, I think that would be such a cool thing. Yep. So I, I think there are some producers locally. He, they came in and uh, picked our brains a few months ago about uh, doing the Freedom Trail, which I think would be super yep. cool. Oh, that's and, a great idea. And that's yeah. that. That's actually been like my number one thing of like trying to explain to someone in Boston what AR can be used for. Um, and then the coolest thing is going along the freedom trail and then being like, and now you can rewatch the Boston massacre, like right here happen in front of you, like to see the 3d models and Dude. like with IOT and AI, you could do so much more with like on people to interact with it as well as like, cause all you need is a chip at each of these locations. Right. And then mm -hmm. you can tell your device, Hey, this is the location you're at yep. and here's the information associated with it. And that can give someone like creating that experience to just have that location, right? And as a part of like their software or app or whatever. Um, and then it it doesn't matter whether or not they've ever been to that location because then they have all the data they need to create an experience related to it. Mm -hmm. um, so that way you can almost have your app version of developers just being able to make experiences for specific locations yep. without ever having to go to the location itself. That's great. Um, which will not happen anytime soon hmm. um, be because basically you need, my phone needs to know that I'm at this place that this developer made this app for. Yep. Um, and that's probably not going to be, it, it, we're waiting for all these other technologies to catch up basically before anything like that can happen. Yeah. And I definitely want to see the standardization happening because having to give people a different app all the time. Uh, exactly. You know, it's just and that, not that's working. what's, that's what's not going to happen anytime yep. soon, especially yep. in the AR. Yep. Uh, sp IOT AI space uh, because everyone's trying to do everyone wants to be the next big thing yeah, in it the killer app um, and until that killer app exists we're not going to get any kind exactly. of standardization exactly so we're just kind of all over the place uh, but we're, we're slowly about getting doing there in web VR though I mean I think um, you know we're looking at we've got a couple opportunities to partner again with the UN and we're thinking about what if you could have stories in every if you could have a scavenger hunt even for storytelling so you're kind of like scavenging, you're scavenging stories um, in different locations in a city that are about a particular topic, like say World Habitat Day or World Environment Day or Urban Habitat. So you could have people go and sort of go on a scavenger hunt because people love scavenger hunts. And actually millennials, you know, I have to say millennials, young millennials and Gen Z, I guess they're calling them, um, which is high school kids, they crave experience and authenticity and so I'm gonna, I think we're going to see a lot more of their generation really demanding as a consumer experience, hands-on, location-based services. I mean, I think that's why the escape rooms are really big. Yep. And VR arcades are kind of, I think, the biggest the, growth market that we're expecting. Along that same thing, industry. geocaching. Yep. Geocaching, yeah, exactly. 
people really love and so i love that because i'm an i'm an outdoorsy person as jason and i were talking about earlier um i love that we're getting people outside of their houses and talking to each other and that's one of the things that as a community media arts center we all that's also part of our mission is to try to get people to have dialogues and to think about you know how we can be involved and engage in civic life with each other through media and technology right and i guess what we do need to make sure is that like i kept saying like we're waiting on technology to catch up that shouldn't prevent us from making these experiences now because right. we totally can yeah um and it it just create you have to build that community which i guess is what you're trying to do um that encourages making that without having necessarily an economic incentive oh if i make this i'll make tons of money um, there, there needs to be something else behind it. Yeah, we f we find to that point, we have found uh, that there aren't that many. We don't know anybody else who's doing what we do actually, um, and that surprises me because I thought I thought two years ago by now a lot of people would be doing this as a community based model. That so that's one of the reasons we created um, VR toolkits that really came out of a bunch of libraries calling us, librarians calling us. Um, they, they had found out somehow that we were the public VR lab and they were interested in having us come and do demos. And what we realized is we don't want to really get into the business of going and doing demos everywhere. And what we're interested in is again, sort of rising tide lifts all boats. We want to teach people how to fish, not give them fish. And so it was in our interest to create a curriculum, some training tools and actually give people a case pelican case with everything they need to do vr in it so it's nice because it it utilizes our two years of expertise of having done all the research already to be able to provide uh governments local governments libraries community media centers boston neighborhood network here in boston just bought one um and we're going to be taking that on the road we're going to be speaking at conferences this summer um, net inclusion which is the digital inclusion conference nationally uh, because we're really talking about accessibility and how we can be inclusive by providing these media and technology tools to local communities. So what we really want is to see little public VR labs start up all over the country and hopefully from our UN work um, the world. We've been talking to some folks in Nigeria and Ghana. Um, we're going to Berlin this summer to uh, teach young people how to do VR storytelling. And our goal is really, we want to teach everyone how to create content figure out what's the best way to do that as things kind of progress in the industry, yep. keep up on that. And uh, these toolkits, I think, are a great way for people to be able to do that. We also have them available for corporations now, too, that they can kind of help subsidize the cost for folks who have really low budgets. Yeah. Uh, and so like, you're trying to teach people who like may not have the skill set. Uh, do you find that your biggest hurdle is actually convincing them that they do have the skill set to learn? How to do it or that they have the aptitude to learn right mm. yeah yeah i think it is hard um you know i think about i think that you know someone like me who has experience in the tech industry and did a little dabbling on programming like it's not it's not overwhelming to me to think about it but even for me like i don't have a lot of time how do i come at night and learn how to learn a new skill so i think um I think a lot of people, yeah, definitely put some obstacles in front of themselves thinking maybe this isn't, I don't know if I can do this or not. But I think we've been teaching for 35 years how <laughs> right. to do media. So I think yep. we're a really accessible place. Our staff are, we have an incredible team here. Everyone's really, really down to earth and um, makes it seem easy. In fact, sometimes we're too good at that where, you know, we're, we make it so easy. People don't hire us. They just go do it themselves, which is fine yep. um, because we do um, some paid production and VR creation work on the side. But we we really that's that's not our business model. We want to teach people how to do it and, and be empowered to create content in this awesome, amazing emerging media. And I, I love that because that is helping the healthy mass adoption of VR. And and let's that's that's important. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think it's going to take some time. I mean, I think we have some, you know, I mean, this show is not about obstacles, but I mean, I could <laughs> certainly, we all probably could have a long discussion about the things that we feel like are getting in the way. I mean, I think I love Google Cardboard, but I feel like for me, that was a big obstacle. And I, I see that, I hear that story a lot where people say, well, I tried VR a couple of years ago or maybe 20 years ago. Uh, right. And I say, no, no, it's really different. You got to come in. So we do free demo nights every Wednesday. We're actually doing this whole Olympics VR thing because we realized that the Olympics are being shown much more than they were in Rio in VR. And actually in Rio, they were a little nauseating and mm -hmm. wasn't quite there yet for people yep. but um they're really heavily promoting it and so we're just doing free demos come in and watch your favorite olympic sport winter olympic sport in vr and at the public vr lab and it's a lot better this year it's a lot better yeah and at, at 
it's, I usually have another analogy for this, but <laughs> like, I don't know, maybe you could say Google Cardboard is like being a kid with like your little red wagon, <laughs> being like, yeah, I tried cars, and then like the HTC Vive is your Maserati. I like that metaphor. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's so great. So it's completely day and night, and you can't say like you've done this until you've actually gone yeah. and, and had the more immersive experience. Yeah. Um, because A, having to hold something to your head, not all that right. great. Right, It takes you um, out of your body. It takes you right. out of the experience. Because you're not normally like this, and my hands are like to my head right now, right? Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> and a lot of people are worried about that nausea. Like, you know, my mom, my mom and I both actually have vertigo. And so, like, I'm always a little careful. Um, but I have to reassure people a lot before they get into VR. And then they're like, you know, these seniors, that a lot of them were worried about that, right? Yep. Yeah. And they got inside of it and they were like, oh, I, I'm not dizzy at all. In fact, they don't even want to come out. You know, we had a guy doing Richie's Plank Experience. I, I posted this video actually on our Instagram. And it's, <laughs> he is a... Uh, He's this older gentleman, and he's kind of very quintessential Boston, and he's missing a particular word that most people in Boston would say when they're expressing something, mm-hmm. which I think you know what I mean. And uh, he said, inside inside of the plank, he's very, she's like, you got to be kidding. <laughs> and uh, and I was like, do you want to come down? He's like, yeah, 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 put me down. And they take the goggles off him, and he says, when can I come back? And I was like, how old are you? Like, you're in your mid to late 70s you know and he was so excited about the experience but also totally freaked out you know and so i think um you know a lot of times you know people who aren't doing the kind of work we are with the public every day forget hey look you know people who aren't vr professionals who aren't involved in the industry at all this is still it's going to be brand new for a long time i mean they're saying 2020 they're expecting 30 percent adoption that's Mm -hmm. still really low yep you know, I feel a lot like I started in um, at the ISP work in 97, and I feel like right now is like the 1999 of, <laughs> of VR, VR, where the internet was in 99, where, you know, I would tell people, hey, you can buy your pet food on uh, on the web. And they're like, why would I do that? You know, but right. you could. 1999, PetSmart had like the first, you know, buy your groceries online kind of thing. And right. it took 20, it took like 17 years, really, before <laughs> people were really buying People still aren't totally adopting the grocery store model right. online. So oh, it's not at all. interesting. I mean, I think we, you know, a lot of it is kind of doing the work that Jobs did, honestly, which is convincing people that they need something before they even can find a function for it. Right. Um, and I feel a lot of times like I'm, I'm sort of this evangelist in VR and I'm kind of selling people on something. But again, they have to try it to really well, to well, see that, the value. Well, that's where I feel like sometimes technology, um, we, some, we focus too much on pushing the technology itself and trying to get technologists to like adopt and develop because it's a very different story to try and get someone who's into technology to get a new technology um, rather than doing the opposite where you're actually right. tra- doing the consumer first and focusing on explicit use cases yep. that benefit their lives. So if you really want to try and convince someone about VR, find something that they care about, find the VR experience for it and tell them how that experience or how, you know, that application is going to improve the way they do that yeah. thing they like yeah um, exactly and from there you're gonna get them to be like oh i want somebody to do that so the real way to do it is to actually ask someone a question and just be like and almost pose them a question of if you could see holograms in the room right now like what what like it could be it could be anything if anything was in the room right now it could just appear in front of you what would you want it to be and what would you use it for if you could just have anything appear in front of you and you could use it as if it were the real thing. Get, when you get people to like set aside what they think technology can do yeah, and let, like ask their imagination right. what right. they think things should do or how the world should work, yep. you're going to get much better answers from them than you Absolutely. ask them like, hey, what do you think VR can do for you? Yeah, they have no idea. They don't, they don't know. They don't understand the technology like we do, so they can't, even, they can't imagine that at all. Yeah, I don't know how many people have tried Google v- uh, Google Earth VR and yeah. not had their minds blown, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's usually usually we do that, and then we do uh, the the uh, the blue um, Richie's plank for we'd never start people off that way because it's way too intense. But I can always tell. I can hear down the hallway. We have this theater uh, where people can sit in the theater and they can watch the person who's trying VR. Um, they're the, what's what they're actually seeing. And so you just hear these screams coming down the hallway. And I'm like, oh, we're, we're demoing Richie's plank experience, apparently. I was going to ask you guys, um, did you, at VRLA last year, 
the guy I always forget, I'm really bad at with names, but the guy who uh, spoke did the keynote from Rick and Morty. Oh, um, from Alchemy uh, Labs. Yes. No. Well, he, uh, Alchemy Labs partnered with them. Oh, uh, but yes. Justin Moyland is yeah. who you're talking about. So I don't know if you are dying. I was like, in st- I was in tears laughing. Like, go watch it <laughs> online. It's he, yeah, he, it, if you, it, if it you is are, online. Yeah, we'll it, put that in the show it's notes. It's so online. funny. It's hilarious. Um, <laughs> I, I learned, yeah, I had like tears streaming down my face. I was laughing so hard. But the, the, the reason it was, one of the things that was really, really funny about it was the fact that he basically made fun of how like useless a lot of VR things are right now. Yeah. And he was like, just and it, and he and and he went on and on like he like told, he made that joke just go for like five minutes and you know and the extremeness of and, how and long the, the joke went on the, was the funny. myths of VR, <laughs> like the um like if you're up VR if you're VRing too late at night and you use ridiculous language like that yeah um the the VR man will come and get you <laughs> yeah exactly exactly apparently yeah, that is absolutely true yeah after after like this whole row sure of like telling you. Once. <laughs> things that like aren't true right and like yeah it, it was just because one of the things about comedy is like you don't expect it right and he just right. went completely oh, yeah, off where just no one expected it so yeah definitely watch that if you haven't seen it <laughs> justin royal and vrla 2017 yeah and to the, to the point that you were making i the reason i bring that up is just that um i feel like there's not enough thinking about what people want i mean i was i did a lot of product marketing and product development in the tech industry and you know, it was around the time, as I said, when um, Facebook kind of went outside of the college sphere and it was announced to the general public. It was like in the very days post Friendster, Mm -hmm. actually, if folks remember that. And and people didn't, they didn't really get social networking or social media or like, why would I want to do that? You know, or um, there was a lot of like, especially, you know, Gen X and and older millennials were kind of just, I don't know, why would I do that, right? But it's um it's kind of like that I think I think right now we need to be thinking what do consumers want and what are the like you said like what are the what are the memes and the models they understand and applying VR to that and also providing things that they want not you know like the things that they don't that are just promo that they found out they want right well sometimes you have to convince <laughs> them that right, they right. want it yeah. it's true but I mean I think having useful the useful functionality of VR and AR is really helpful in getting a broader adoption rate. Yep. And and do you think it's more of finding those experiences? Because I think it's even more about getting people to even try those experiences in the first place. Yeah. Even. I think, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I was super psyched uh, this October when I was at the Future Storytelling, which I love. I, I'm just going to totally promote them because I love the Future Storytelling Conference. It's awesome. The Future Storytelling Festival in New York in the fall. Um, I was on the boat with... Uh, I won't say which company, but a a vice president of, like the president of interactive for a very large company who talked about how they have to have place-based VR arcades, basically. That's what they think um, the industry, that's how the industry will gl- grow is by having something in your community that is showing you like a place where you can go to outside of your home. And I think I actually just ha- heard a, I think Ken Bai just interviewed somebody that said something similar, which was it's VR is going to grow by us seeing it out in the world and seeing the applications of it. Like the Olympics actually is kind of a good example, right? It's a good use case for people. So, so it may be that we go out to an arcade and try VR. We go to the public VR labs around the country, I hope, and try VR community library or some other organization. And then, and then we think, oh, maybe I should get one of those at home, you know? And that's, that is how it works sometimes for different right. technologies. But I think it is more of an outward to inward situation oh, that I, may be the way that it flows for VR. Well, I think that the biggest things right now are things like what, what Disney's doing, which is having like a Star Wars VR experience that you can do at the Disney parks. Right, right. right or exactly. going and doing, um, like there's a zombie one locally here in Boston at Mind Trek VR. Yep, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. Totally. Um, and then those kinds of location based things where yep. it's like you take your friends to do it and it's lots of fun. Yeah. Um, cruises. And, cruises are starting to adopt VR. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if you're already going somewhere else. And you're it's on also a cruise, kind of weird, though, isn't it? But, like, <laughs> I'm on a cruise trying to be present on this beautiful place, you know. 
But I want to get it, maybe you want to get away. Some people don't like boats. They find out they don't Why like boats. A them? lot of people, maybe they yeah. find out they don't like boats, <laughs> and be, now they're trapped on one for at least a week. Let's let's be honest. Most people, uh, not most people, but a lot of people on cruise ships are not there to see open ocean for seven days yeah, straight. That's right. True. Yeah, they're, they're there going, for buffets, entertainment. <laughs> you know, having ports, fun with friends, gambling, yeah, shopping. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Good Hitting point, up the islands, point. yeah, yeah exactly. all sorts of things. I heard some of them even have like uh, ice rinks on them these days. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Water like, parks, slides, everything. Yeah. <laughs> and and now VR apparently. Mm-hmm. It's gonna be everywhere. It's just gonna. I think it's gonna take some time. It's gonna take some time to infiltrate our consciousness too. It's a it, it's a kind of a crazy paradigm shift. I mean, I really do think uh, you know when when Robert Scoble and and Shay Israel say that it's the fourth. The fourth, what do they say? It's the fourth reality. Mm. I think they called it in their book, or the fourth, yeah, the fourth reality. Um, that it's, or the fourth dimension. I can't remember, but it's a, it's basically like a, as big of a paradigm shift as the internet was. And I think that's why it feels like 1999 to me because that was a really big shift in how people thought about that particular technology and saw, started to see that it was going to be revolutionizing everything. But it took a while for yeah. that to really sink in, like, how am I going to use this, you know? Right. And so the speaking of how you're going to use this, uh, specifically, you have another project the Brookline Interactive Group is working on? Yeah, and actually, um, so this is a project of the Public VR Lab, which I know is kind of confusing, but um, Brookline Interactive is kind of like our umbrella organization, and it's our traditional community media arts center here in Brookline. So Brookline Interactive is kind of the the – the host for lots of different projects. Um, we have artist residencies for VR now here, which is super cool. Um, we have the VR Academy, um, all under sort of the project auspices of the Public VR Lab. Right. But a lot of these other projects, um, you know, we had last summer a project with the STAT News team at the Boston Globe, which was super cool. We kind of trained them up. Their production team already knew production, but we trained them up on 360 filmmaking. We did three projects with them. One at the Ebola, the National, in, the National Infectious Emerging Infectious Diseases Lab. Uh, so we interviewed this amazing scientist, got to walk through the chemical shower with the 360 camera in a hazmat suit. So super cool. And uh, and then one from the uh, perspective of the the Boston uh, Children's Hospital, their infant trauma unit. So we're able to, you're really able to step inside of that experience of being one of the members of the team that's saving infants' lives. And then the last story that we just won an award for on innovation, actually, which is called Open Wide, and it's um, a a Tufts Dental School patient, uh, student rather, going through their day dealing with patients and um, their experience. So we showed all of those at Hub Week here in Boston, which is going to be the, I think, the South by Southwest of the East Coast, we hope. <laughs> Interesting. In, in years future. Um, it's supported. It's actually sponsored by the Boston Globe. And so we did about 1,200 demos of those three projects. And that was a really great partnership. And now we're doing a lot of work with journalists and filmmakers, um, librarians on this project. Um, called Immigration in Full Frame. And it's all, it's a national collaborative project about immigration stories collected from, we have um, Alaska, participants from Alaska, Washington, Oregon, California, Minnesota, South Dakota, Kansas, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, all the way up to Maine, Boston. And we're gonna be in Philly, in fact, um, this weekend to do our first out of state 360 filmmaking training for our partners in that project. So they're all uh, going to their communities and capturing stories of immigrants from all the way from 1620 to 2018. So we're actually gonna create a visual timeline of all of these stories, a mosaic if you will, of um, what we're calling the, the melting stew, not a melting pot. Because uh, in a stew your characters are a little bit more you can you can taste all the flavors, and I think that's a better metaphor. Um, we sort of borrowed that from uh, Adam Strom, who's our partner. He's in uh, the project Reimagining Migration, and used to work with Facing History, Facing Ourselves here in Brookline. Mm-hmm. So, um, partnering with them, we've got uh, Green Card Voices involved from Minnesota, who's been doing this work for years. Uh, we've got a li- we've got two, I think, one or two librarians involved, which is super cool, right here in Massachusetts in Framingham. Um, we've got Connecticut folks. Um, I think it's going to be amazing. We have 25 different countries that are represented in those immigration stories. And uh, we'll be creating also a traditional documentary in addition to the VR experience. So the idea is 
um, this is a huge issue facing our country right now. It's, it's yep. really part of the national dialogue for the last year. And it's probably going to continue to be that way for the next three years. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we're trying to figure out, one, I don't think there's ever been a national collaborative project in VR before that I know of. I'd love to hear if there are because we'd love to learn from you. So please contact me. But um, <laughs> to, the, to, to my knowledge, we haven't heard of anybody trying to do this level of a project uh, across the country from, you know, Alaska to Boston. Um, and so that's exciting. But then also to do the timeline where we're really trying to look at, look, this is a country of immigrants. We are we're almost all immigrants here. And um, and really, everybody came from somewhere else, um, even Native Americans. But I think looking at, you know, these arguments people make around immigration, and, we, and we're and we not, we really don't have a position, but we, we want to look at some of these things that are coming up in, in the national dialogue, like, hey, my family came here legally, why can't yours? That's something we hear quite often. And I think, I think it's an interesting question. So one of the things in the timeline that I think will be interesting inside of VR is to see, well, actually, there were no laws on immigration until 1924. So we can also kind of submit some policy information into the context that these immigrants came into this country and what their experience was like, because really everybody's stories are different. And that's part of, I think, what makes our country really amazing and incredible and really rich. So, um, you know, we don't know that we're going to move the needle on that dial of immigration uh, nationally, but we hope that we'll provoke thought, like I said at the beginning, um, challenge some assumptions of everyone, um, provoke some thought, uh, get people to maybe have some discussions locally, and we're hoping we can do screenings. We're hoping to um, screen at some film festivals next year with it um, in all of these you know, 15 different partners across uh, 14 different states. Are the film festivals the only way for, let's say, our listeners to be able to check it out? Well, right now, uh, we're still in production, so it's, mm -hmm. it's another six months in production for that. Yep. But um, definitely for the, the Ebola stories and the, the 360 productions that we do with the Boston Globe stat team, that, those are all available on publicvrlab.com. Mm -hmm. um, the content, I th I'm pretty sure that we have the link to the UN experience that we showed, uh, that we demoed in, in Kenya. That's available on our website as well. And uh, we have a couple of AR experiences that you can actually download Traces, which is um, the neuroscientist Bo Lado's app. Um, they created an app, and it's all geolocated storytelling in AR. And so you can actually, we uh, went to the Washington, D.C. Historic Women's March last January, and I uploaded myself about um, 77 individual stories and photographs from that march on the parade route. So you can actually walk along the National Mall, and you can download you can cap capture um, stories that are floating around you about the Women's March that happened on that day that we were marching. We also have one um, for the Boston Marathon, just through, through Brookline. So those were both kind of pilot experiments for us. So um, you know, we're looking forward to this one that we're doing here locally with uh, Brookline Monument. And um, yeah, so people can definitely check out the website. Uh, we haven't put anything in Steam just yet. I'm sure we will mm -hmm. at some point. Um, but I think for now, that's probably the best way for folks to find out about the work that we're doing. We, we love to collaborate, obviously. You know, we're working with 15 different organizations around the country. We love to collaborate, and we want to really get these toolkits out to the world because we do feel like the adoption of VR is going slower than we anticipated. And this actually provides a great opportunity for people like libraries and local organizations to jump in now and to learn how to provide the skills that folks need to, this com to their community and um, be part of creating the new creative economy because we think that's really important. It's, it's moving to a gig economy. People need to have more technical skills. Media uh, is still is very important and in a lot of ways is more important to have um, hyper-local media that really talks about what's going on at the hyper-local level. And I think, we, I think what's exciting is that we sort of have reinvented community media to be a part of that future and we hope to, to bring other community media centers along with us as well. Since we're on that subject, what's the best way for someone who might be interested in starting a public VR lab or utilizing the toolkit? What's the best way to reach you? Definitely, they can they can they can email me, <laughs> <laughs> um, Kathy at BrooklineInteractive.org. They can uh, give us a call. They can go to our website, PublicVRLab.com, and uh, and also on you know Instagram and Twitter. I, I respond to all tweets. Anybody tweets at me, I will <laughs> respond. I love love talking to people there. Um, near our lead creative designer is our Instagram uh, 
facilitator, so you can find us there too. Um, we're not on Facebook that much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's interesting, really shifted a lot. Uh, we also try to get out to a lot of events, and um, we, we did have meetups for a while. You guys are so amazing in the Boston VR meetup, though. It's, um, it's hard to compete, not that we were, but <laughs> or could, but um, we are part of Women in Next Realities. Mm-hmm. I'm on the steering committee for yep. that, so I definitely want to encourage people, women especially, to um, get involved in VR. I think it's a great place for women and for some of our natural skill sets that we've sort of been stereotypically and traditionally socialized for. Um, I think they fit really well with VR. And I also want to see more women involved in STEM and tech. Um, I, you know, I have the experience of being the only woman in the room many times in Silicon Valley. Um, I've dealt with a lot of sexual harassment. And uh, we need more women's voices and we need more people of color in the VR industry. And they have a lot to offer. So definitely would encourage people to to come to the winter events as well yes as boston vr yep um and so the other thing i I actually wanted to point out is when he asked like where can you find it you mentioned steam as your first thought yeah um so i was actually talking to Richard steiber about this at svvr last year uh and that's the thing that he's trying to do with viveport is because you think steam your first thing you want to you think about is games games. is they don't want viveport to become this place for like vive games to be Yep. Um, that's like what Steam is for. Yep. Uh, so Viveport is more for like the films experiences. Oh, awesome. um, like where can you go get VR experiences that tell you more about the world you live in? Um, that's great. Where, where can you go experience VR films? He wants to make mm-hmm. Viveport that kind of destination. Yeah. And I know Oculus Home is trying to build up that kind of persona too. They were trying to do that with the Oculus Story Studios uh, yeah. and things like that. So they're just look at other platforms um, for Definitely. distribution. Uh, and we'd if love even to have a partnership with them, in fact. <laughs> and, <laughs> and if you want to go like even like more high tech, um, there's even a platform called like LBRY that accepts like has its own cryptocurrency associated mm, with it. Cool. Um, that they just kind of do generally everything. They're okay. trying. They're kind of trying to do more of YouTube type content, but yep. they're kind of accepting everything right now. But anyway, my point being was, look at uh, a broader range of distribution platforms because uh, Steam. Especially for non-gaming content, Steam right. is not necessarily a place to be yep. or go with it. Yeah, that's good to know. We're we'll, we're going to be reaching out to him again, actually, to uh, to talk about some partnership opportunities. So maybe we'll uh, we'll be some of the featured content there someday. Excellent. That'd be, that'd be <laughs> great. Looking forward to it. Yeah. 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 Well, I th- I just think your immigration piece would be perfect for that. Yeah. yeah. Um, like we have an opportunity kind of to thing. have it um, also nationally syndicated as well. That's been offered to us. So I think both for the traditional documentary work and for the VR. There, there's going to be some amazing stories. We're already starting to hear about them. Um, I'm really excited to go to the training this weekend and, and hear from our partners. I mean, we have everyone from people who've actually created films to folks who have never picked up a camera. Right. So I think it's a, a very exciting collaborative, and there's going to be some amazing stories. And, and we're also going to watch how the we have a, a, a tool that we're using that we've created to watch how the themes change throughout the year with the interviews because we imagine there's going to be some shift based on what's happening. Um, you know, you might hear more of these kinds of stories, less of this kind of issue, more about this issue. So that'll be interesting too, I think, to sort of have a little bit of a finger on the pulse of what's happening on the field, in the field, on the ground. Um, you know, I want to say one other thing. Folks who have community media centers, public access television stations, as we are kind of formally known, we mostly call ourselves community media centers now, look for them in your community and go ask them to provide VR. Because if they haven't found out about the work that we're doing, um, we have been at the national conferences and such, but you know, we'd love to have you direct them to us so that we can help them come up to speed and help them support their local community. They may not know that this exists or that these tools exist for storytelling, or they may just be hesitant to jump on uh, to the next bandwagon because some people aren't sure where this is going, you know? Um, So we can really help kind of walk them through that process and support them in giving them curriculum and giving them the toolkit and helping provide um, sort of a ladder up to everyone because we would love to see tech folks working with community media, with traditional community media, to really support creatives in their local communities. Right. Yeah, and so one more thing on the immigration piece uh, that I wanted to mention is that, like, so my favorite thing right now is Hamilton and has been for the past, like, two, two that. and a half Thank years, you, almost three years like even. One of the first people who told and, me that. like, one of my favorite lines is immigrants, we get the job done. 
right? And then that's so his story is like one thing where you think he's just this rich old white guy. And that's what Lynn Manuel Miranda thought. That's like mm-hmm. he's always one of those founding fathers, those rich people that started the country. Yeah. And then you find out he came out from nothing, was you know this immigrant that came out of nothing and then worked his way up, right? And that's just one story. So I can't imagine when you come in with a VR experience that has 35, 30 different stories. You said 25 Absolutely. different countries. Yeah. You know, that many stories. Exactly. Like, that really could be something that changes the narrative From 16, for people. 20, too. I mean, yeah. think about that timeline. We don't. We often just hear about the last 20 years, people or people who came this year or last year. Mm-hmm. To hear that whole timeline, I think, is going to be really cool. Too. I'm still trying to right. figure out how do I, in VR, uh, reenact my ancestor falling off the Mayflower? Because right. my my uh, I'm a descendant of the only guy who fell off the Mayflower on the way over. So we kind of think oh, well, wow. either he was drunk or he was like political or <laughs> something. He's probably outspoken. <laughs> he went out for a walk and he fell over and he just grabbed a lanyard on the way down. Um, huh. And he was a, he was a servant <laughs> actually. That's how he 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 basically was in servitude and uh, ended up being one of the people who like. Uh, because of that they thought he was like chosen by god and so suddenly he got a little elevated he was still uh, because he fell off because he fell off yeah because he made it he made it he survived <laughs> and got back on yeah survived, <laughs> oh, wow. yeah that's like you know they pulled him up some people help but you know wow. that's kind of a big thing i think but he ended up you know there's this whole i, I love history so there was this whole uh, the commonwealth you know the the you know uh early on uh the plymouth colony before it was the Commonwealth, was um, kind of divided up between the status quo people who are just like, we should not leave the perimeter of the village, right? And then the people who are like, hey, let's go over there and see what's over there. Well, I'm, my, I'm a descendant of one of those guys, clearly. Mm-hmm. Um, but he actually ended up going to Maine and checking out Maine as part of the activities of the Plymouth Colony. And he was still, he was a servant to the governor. He got elevated to that. But then my ancestors ended up, um, you know, taking a buckboard and, and riding horses up to Western Maine. And that's how I'm now a 13th generation Mainer. Um, so, you know, our my family story will probably be in there if I can figure out how to, you know, simulate him falling over the Mayflower because it's kind of a fun, fun little tidbit. Okay. Any last thoughts or anything you want to <sighs> tell to our listeners? Yeah, I mean, I guess there's two things. Um, I would just say one to creators to think about sort of the lowest common denominator, if you will. So think about who has not had access to these tools and technology and how you can make it accessible. So keep the barriers to entry really low for people because um, I think that's really important this early on to make it accessible and to, um, to make things affordable, to keep, you know, I'd love to see the headsets come down in price. You know, we talk to people all the time who are just like, yeah, I just can't afford this. <laughs> right. we, we talk to developers like that, right? I mean, we talk to developers yep. who are like, I can't even, I'm coming into your lab because I can't afford this myself and I, yet I'm making awesome content in it. And so we want to facilitate that and support that, empower that. But I think if the price could go down, I mean, you know, $3,000 is a lot for a HoloLens. We'd like to see that be more affordable. Yeah. Um, and I think it will get there, but, you know, I really, I think it can't happen fast enough. Mm-hmm. And um, and then make things accessible, you know, I mean, I think one of the biggest threats right now to VR is the cryptocurrency mining. Yep. Because all, uh, we all can't, buy, gra- can't buy graphics cards. cards. It's, yep. it's crazy. I mean, we're just trying to buy them for, for our video editing machines here, right? And for our VR machines. And yep. Really, they're like three times what they cost last year, the yep. year before. Yeah, it's insane. <laughs> so that's a real problem. So, I mean, I think, you know, the industry needs to work together to make these solutions um, accessible, inexpensive, easy for folks to, to gain access to. And also, um, you know, when you're creating content, please think about diversity. Please think about having um, women on your team, people of color on your team. Um, think about the, co- the, creator, the characters that you're creating about whether you're reflecting the real world. And I think... Um, the problem is, is that, you know, you think about when you look at a, you look at the web and you search for CEO, it's CEO Barbie is the only woman represented. This was true six months ago. I, I checked because I wasn't sure it's been true for a while. So that's a real problem because people who are programming the algorithms for search engines, they're programming it like that. So if we as a VR community think about how we want to create the new world of VR, and the industry of VR, if we can create it with diversity in mind and in thinking about what do we want, what do we want our daughters to see when they're in VR? Right. We want them to see someone who looks like them kicking ass, 
sorry. <laughs> um, or, you know, we, we, want, we want people to feel um, like there's someone that looks like them in the room and yep. that, uh, that isn't stereotypical. And, uh, you know, I think there's lots of that change happening now, but I want to see this generation of VR users and creators really take it to the next level with that. So that's, that's my plea. And uh, come into the VR, public VR lab. You could help create that content of the future, make it accessible for everyone. So VR for, for real change, I hope. Thank you so much for, for joining us and speaking with us. And um, we yeah, can't. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. It's yeah. really, it's been wonderful. And I just enjoy talking with both of you as always. And thanks so much for having me on. And I wish you guys best of luck with this. This has been another episode of the Virtuality Podcast. We'll see you in this reality or the next. Thank you so much for listening. We would like to keep sharing more about VR and AR with you, so please consider a few dollars to our Patreon linked in the show notes. The Virtuality Podcast is produced by Jason Parks and music by Rachel Dzinski. This podcast is in collaboration with Boston VR and Boston AR. Monthly meetups and events can be found on meetup.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at VirtualityCast and learn more at our website, virtuality.show.